Thank you everyone for coming. I'm Juanita Marlowe, BDM at Street Furniture Australia. Can everyone hear me okay? Is it all clear? Just give me a thumbs up if you're on screen. Cool, thank you. I can see we've got a number of people who have joined us. I've actually got which is really great. Today we have our first um, ASLA AILA meetup, which is very exciting. We have important guests, presidents of the ASLA San Diego chapter and AILA New South Wales chapter here at the hosts. Uh, Christopher Stebbins, you want to just give us a wave, Chris, so everyone can see you, and Lee Andrews. Lee, thank you. We'd like to start today with an acknowledgement of country. And I will hand that over to you, Lee. Brilliant. Thank you. Yes, as you say, this is an exciting moment. Um, I think it's certainly a first for us here in New South Wales, um, you know, to be able to converse as uh, directly uh, as this. In the past, we've uh, always, you know, relied on conferences and travelling. But as we know, COVID has um, sort of wrecked, uh, wrecked certain havoc around the world. But out of that... There are these little moments, just like this, where, you know, as I say, we can come together in unique moments. And I'm sort of, well, I'm very excited by this. Uh, Chris and I have had one or two chats already, and we certainly are looking for ways where we can come together more often. Here in New South Wales, uh, we have 679 active uh, landscape architects and active members, you know, that's of the 3,000 national members, um, and that's across all of Australia. So it's a pretty good, pretty good number. I am speaking to you from North Sydney, New South Wales, Australia, um, but it's also Camaragal land. The Camaragal are the traditional custodians of this land, and I would just like to acknowledge their traditions and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I also acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the land we call Australia. And I'd like to also pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and welcome their descendants to the meeting. For those that you're not familiar with the acknowledgement of country, why do we do it? Well, it's basically a tradition as old as the Aboriginal culture. Acknowledgement of country seeks permission to enter and cross the land of your neighboring uh, 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 nation. It's also a promise that as you're crossing that land to respect their laws. Acknowledgement of country today demonstrates respect for traditional custodians, their country and their history. But why this forum? You know, why do we want to get together? Why do we think it's important the you know, Ayla, New South Wales and San Diego could get together. Why do we think that homify as a concept might be of interest to you? Well, I'd, I'd just like to refer to a talk um, from Richard Florida, a US urban theorist. He spoke at the Committee of Sydney, who's an, sort of a city, um, an urban think tank group. He spoke at a recent event and the title there was One Year of COVID, What Have We Learned and Where Next? <clears throat> In that talk, he basically uh, referred to cities need to be super attractive. Well, what's that mean? They need to provide a balance of live, work and play uh, locally. You know, I think he's suggesting the, the idea of commute uh, to work is possibly dead. Uh, public spaces and streets need to be almost super active. They need to sort of sustain us beyond the nine to five. But the CBD, or what we call the Sydney Business District, or what you call the downtown, possibly will become an NBD. No, not a no big deal, but actually a neighbourhood business district. The emphasis being neighbourhood. But I think sort of central to all of this thinking was this idea that... Uh, the, the climate that we live in is going to be a, a significant con contributor. Uh, so, you know, temperate climate, plenty of sun, but particularly 
opportunities for outdoor recreation, harbour, parks, etc. San Diego and Sydney have these qualities. Now, I'm not saying they're limited to these two cities, but it was certainly one of the drivers for this uh, forum today. So given the above, as I said earlier, I think Homify is tapping into this change and I certainly look forward to the discussion that we can have afterwards. So with that, Chris, I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, it's an honor to be here at the inception of something that might uh, most likely continue into the future. Um, as someone who's traveled a lot and is kind of an urban design nerd, I, I've uh, met with a lot of practitioners, academics, and noticed a lot of best practices across the world, and that includes Australia. And having this uh, collaboration uh, and, and sharing of information, this cross-pollination, as it were, is kind of a really logical step, and we're taking advantage of the inability, I guess, um, looking at the looking at it with a uh, rose-colored glasses of being able to, uh, you know, continue these virtual um, conferences without the overhead costs of, of travel. And um, I think this is just a really logical step. Um, I've seen in, in in Australia thing practices that really. Uh, would have been um, best shared um, with with uh, American cities, and and when I came back here after traveling for a while, um, I saw the um, I noticed certain practices here in uh, America that were um, quite unique. So uh, I'm really excited about this, and uh, just a little bit about my background. Uh, this is my second career uh, in landscape architecture and urban design. And uh, my first one was geography. I was a geographer for a really long time. So I've always been interested in the interaction of human beings and um, the landscape. But now I'm very passionate about not only the ecological function, but also the human habitat aspect of cities and how, they, how uh, well-designed cities uh, serve the human animal and their behaviors and their, um, and their socialization and, and their mental health. So um, my background, as far as my research and what I um, push in all, a lot of my uh, research and a lot of my presentations that I've given um, uh, in, uh, in this country and others is kind of more of universal principles of psychological and sociological principles that are applicable to all human beings. Um, but that being said, the, the homify process seems to be extremely valuable um, in, the, in the sense that it is truly contextualizing design with the people that live there and the people who are we are serving. And so I'm, I'm really excited about its ability to facilitate co-design between the designers, but also um, with the people who, who, who we are serving um, in the market that it is serving and the community that it is serving. Uh, we do a fair amount of community input here in the United States, um, but this is kind of formalizing it, well, especially in, in, in the planning um, as, uh, aspects of, of our uh, professional practices, but uh, Homify is just kind of a, a little bit more ordered and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the cooperative nature of the Homify process as it can apply to Olympic Park. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Christopher and Lee. Uh, when we were brainstorming what we could, um, what could be a topic of mutual interest for us on both sides of the Pacific, the elephant in the room, of course, was COVID-19. So today we have a case study to spark discussion, Homify Sydney Olympic Park. We're about to play a video that goes for 25 minutes and explains in depth. This video was made for AILA Land Escape Conference in October last year. It's cut down version of that webinar. I'd like to introduce you to the Homify team before we begin, who are already here and ready to respond to your questions and answers after the video. We have, if you guys could just wave your hand, uh, we have David Martin. He's a registered landscape architect and manager uh, of public domain design with the Sydney Olympic Park Authority and one of the kickstarters of the Homify project at SOPA. Uh, Professor Mark Armstrong, if you could give us a wave wherever you are. <laughs> He's a fellow at the Design Institute of Australia and design director at Street Furniture Australia. Mark co-led the Homify research on the Street Furniture Australia side. June Lee Boxall, who give us a wave, is head of marketing and innovation at Street Furniture Australia. 
June partnered with Mark on the Homify research to feed into Street Furniture's Australia's new product development. We're also very thrilled to have Richard Nugent. Where are you, Richard? Give us a wave. Design director at CM Plus, the urban designers for Homify. Dick took part in the Homify research phase and also led the development of design concepts for Sydney Olympic Park. Over to you, Tiff. Thank you, I'll just share my screen and start the video. Welcome to our Homifying Sydney Olympic Park webinar. We will talk about how human-centred design was applied for community consultation at Sydney Olympic Park. Human-centred design is a process more typically seen in product or software development than in placemaking. At Street Furniture Australia, we use human-centred design to create our products and services. But it also turns out it is also an effective tool for deeply understanding the needs and aspirations of a community. But perhaps we should ask first, what does homify mean? Well, it's a made up word for a project that aims to bring life, joy and comfort to the everyday experiences of Sydney Olympic Park. It is an initiative led by the Sydney Olympic Park Authority in collaboration with CM Plus and Street Furniture Australia. To homify is to create an ambience that is comfortable and immediately relaxing, a feeling that evokes I'm home. Okay, well, we'll just start with the basics. Um, David. Some background on Sydney Olympic Park. Sydney Olympic Park um, is probably known to many of you from what happened 20 years ago, but it's also in terms of landscape architecture a global hotspot. There's been over 30 continuous years of practice starting with Bicentennial Park. Hundreds and hundreds of landscape architects have contributed to many layers of landscape architecture on the peninsula. We're also reflecting on the next 20 years. We're having an important celebration, the 20th anniversary of the best games ever. But this is really a for more future focus session today. We're going to homify Sydney Olympic Park. What are the biggest challenges that the people who live and work and study there face? The space was originally designed for major events. Anything from 100 to 200,000 people moving through the precinct in one day. So the space is a massive. The scale of the space has to be much more intimate, designed around human connection and social interaction. Mark, you've come to the precinct with fresh eyes, an industrial designer, experienced designer perspective. Right, yeah. What was your impression of Sydney Olympic Park? Well, I think as David mentioned, scale was the first thing that I noticed. You know, the footpaths, the walkways, the spaces are just large, designed to take crowds of over 100,000 people. But now there's communities living there. It needs to have a smaller human scale so that you feel comfortable and at home in a, in a place like that. The resident population will increase by something like 480% within the next 10 years. That's right. By the end of this year, we'll have something like 4,000 people calling the park home. But around the park, there are many more tens of thousands of people. Ultimately, the park will have a population over 20 the peninsula itself, probably in the next 10 years, will have a daytime resident population close to 100,000 people. Mark, you've identified some challenges relating to Sydney Olympic Park. and You've been practicing human-centred design for many years now. What is human-centred design and why, do, why, why should we do it? Deeply understanding the people that you're designing for. It's like walking in their footsteps. How can you understand their needs if you don't, don't understand their circumstance properly? And that's the main function of human-centred design, to empower designers so that they create environments and experiences that enrich people's lives. David, you know, you've experienced human-centred design firsthand. How is it different to the normal community consultation process? I'd say there's three things. The first is about being prepared to listen and listen deeply, but also resisting uh, the temptation to pick the pen up. You've got to put the pen down and do the listening first. Many designers, architects, urban designers, landscape architects will want to pick the pen up uh, or do the CAD work and say, I've got all the answers. But this is really saying put the pens down. <laughs> and do the listening first. Also, we're designing experiences rather than the places. And what that engages and what that requires you is to see that your work is divided between what some people in placemaking call the software and the hardware. Traditionally, built environment professionals are responsible for the hardware, the place, the paving, the design, the elements, the furniture. Yet, what we're learning through these human-centered methodologies is that the activations and the programming, the activities that occur in the space are equally as important. This must be music to your ears, Mark. <laughs> exactly. You want to bring enjoyment and life into the space. And you've, the, as a designer, there are lots of ways of doing that. And as you mentioned, David, like the hardware is just one. 
Uh, and it's what, what it enables, the affordances that it creates, places to sit, enjoy the sunshine, walk the dog, bringing life where people would meet where otherwise they won't. And I think you've called this uh, meeting unmet needs, Mark. That's exactly right. And sometimes you don't know what these needs are at the start. Because in, in our process, we listen with, you know, uh, open mind of what this community needs. And it's often hard for designers to get rid of their preconceptions about what a space should be. We need to pivot a little bit to COVID. David, how has COVID impacted the people there? June, like um, all Australian communities, and I guess in a global sense, COVID's having an enormous impact on business and communities, but there's been a bit of a silver lining, I think, for people who live near the park because they get to enjoy all this amazing local space. But on the other hand, of course, there's been a massive slowdown. We can't host major events. It's really meant that a lot of the smaller businesses have to pivot towards the locals and becoming what we call hyper-local. We do have a lot of small businesses who traditionally used to serve some of the crowds going to the major events. A lot of the cafes are set up for the office workers who, of course, are there at the moment, but in greatly diminished numbers. I guess there's an opportunity for us to really think about the future community of the next 10 years and start to focus on that group. Residents and the local business owners. Local businesses, local residents. COVID has probably been what you'd call a catalyst towards this change that was coming. We could argue that um, through Homify it might have sped things up. And Mark, you've um, personally engaged with the business owners, interviewed them through your empathy interview technique. What did you learn? First, the empathy interview is about understanding, as I mentioned before. And the only way to do that is sort of to have designers sit face to face and really understand the end users, the owners and the stakeholders. Sitting with them, it was really fascinating to hear their stories because that's what we encourage. We want them to not answer questions, yes or no, how many bums did they have on seats on a Saturday morning or anything like that. We wanted to hear deeply their emotions and what they felt about the circumstance. They were so resilient. Without exception, they were all you know, engaging with us, uh, wanting to be part of the design. And that for me is really uplifting. As soon as we told them we were designers, we wanted to understand what they were thinking, what they felt. Well, away they went with so many stories that really informed what we're doing. And we were fortunate to talk with Andrew, um, the co-owner of the restaurant you mentioned. Um, should we have a look at, at the clip? The bad is just the, the volatility of the area at the moment. It's just so much um, change happening in such a short period of time. And everything that seems to happen here seems to revolve and focus around the events. With the announcement of the stadium closing, it's now time to start really putting the residents as the big focus with what we do here. The residents are yearning and dying for something special. A lot of the business owners want to make the spaces more vibrant, more people to come and have fun and relax in those spaces. Music and summer gin bar and craft beer. Sounds Our, very hipster. That's right. So <laughs> the laneway spaces that are not well known at Sydney Olympic Park, we do have a network of everyday places and spaces that have got a lot of potential for activation. Now we should talk about the techniques we use during the community consultation, the discovery process as we call it. Mark, you've introduced us to some pretty cool tricks to really get to know the community. I'll start with the empathy interview. What is an empathy interview? How is it different from an interview? Well, an empathy interview is more of a discussion. It's where you engage with a stakeholder, let's say a resident or a retailer, and you don't ask a set of closed questions that require yes or no answers. You more or less say, how do they feel? And tell me more about that. And then you encourage storytelling. And the, what happens there is something quite amazing. Because when you go in with a set set of questions that are closed, you get answers that you're expecting. But when you go and you ask somebody, tell me about how that makes you feel, well, you get some surprising responses. And the real goal for a designer is where things come out that you just didn't expect. You know, like I had trouble crossing the road or there was difficulty to park my bike. They tell you about stories. That triggers ideas in a designer's mind and we were taking notes madly. It's not just harvesting information. It's genuinely understanding their circumstance so you, you can design for them. In a normal community consultation, usually the question that gets asked is, what would you like to see in this space? What do you want to see? And that's 
kind of the opposite of what human-centered design is. You always say, Mark, the questions are just as important as the answers. For Homify, the questions you suggested were quite good, like how does this place make you feel? Describe the journey on your way here. Describe your happiest memory from this place and describe the most challenging time that impacted your experience. They're the two extremes. So if you think about the best things that happened to you in the park, you know, what was wonderful, uh, I mean, that can also, because from a designer's perspective, you're thinking, how do we amplify that? What were those circumstances? How can we use that and spread it across the park? And then equally, on the other extreme, what went terribly wrong? So now we can say, okay, well, what caused that? What was the sequence of events? What was the environment that facilitated those things to be unpleasant? And then we can, they, they become opportunities for design. We start off the interview with the question, what inspires you? And it kind oh, of yeah, breaks the ice a little bit um, because people don't expect that from you. And it shows that you're interested in that person. It just says from a very personal point of view, tell us about what are you passionate about? And it's really good, it's quite a neutral and a good way to start the discussion and the discovery right. process. It certainly starts the discussion, doesn't it? Because then you have this sort of friendly rapport. The CEO of a major corporation would say, what inspires me is my family. And then suddenly everything becomes um, even plain. People are what inspire me, passionate, smart people with a good sense of humour. I'll go with happiness. Our environment. Open green spaces and all the things going on in those spaces. One word that always comes to my mind is fun. There's family. Sustainability. Innovation. Community. Definitely family. Evolution. Imagination. My word is design. Caring. Life. Possibility. Be music. Colour. Change. Change. Inspires me is diversity. Diversity of ideas, diversity of people, diversity of experiences. One thing that inspires me at the moment or a word is space. We're really re-evaluating what space looks like because of COVID. So what you can do obviously inside your home, but more importantly, what you have on the doorstep. Delight, because it taps into our basic humanity, our great need to have fun and meaning in our lives. The next technique here is uh, observation at Apple. Um, the old MacBook, um, they've got the magnetic clip oh, yes. and um, you know nobody said I would like a magnetic clip to plug my laptop. They observed a hundred people fumbling exactly right, to, sure. to come up with that beautiful solution. So observation was also an important part of this. It is. Um, yeah, to, to see the pain points. Because one of the things with observation is just sitting for a while and just let the space sort of wash over you and you watch the comings and goings and the things that go on in a space. And it's sort of remarkable how adaptive people are to circumstances and, you know, like the, the famous um, wayfinding circumstance where people cut across the park, but yet designers and architects have put this lovely geometric uh, pathway um, where people I don't travel. Uh, Design lines. Design, Design lines. lines. That's it. But you see yeah. those sorts of things, and that's why it's very important to use both things in conjunction: the empathy interviews to understand the people, um, their feelings, and then. Observation, spending time in the environment. As a design consultant, sometimes you don't get the fee structures to just go and spend an afternoon mm. and sit. And I understand the pressures that everybody faces, but it yields 10 times the time that you put in for something like that. Because you suddenly have deeper understanding of the environment and the community, and your design is so much richer for it. And I think the work that CM Plus did in documenting the architects engaged for Homify. Yes. That's right. So they actually did a very good job at recording things like desire lines and activation zones, because that everyone knows that the way that people behave during major event mode. This analysis of everyday place and space behaviour is a new thing. It's been great to go through that with a team of people who've had the skills and the technology to be able to record and observe human behaviours in an everyday sense. Which leads to the next natural um, technique, which is personas. Oh yes, that's good. We should talk about personas. <laughs> I think this may be a new uh, concept for uh, landscape architects. I think it's well used in marketing. Sure is. Uh, as a tool, but I think yeah, we should definitely talk about our personas. After having done the interviews, you can then start to see, and you have to use a certain amount of judgment here. This is an in 
an inexact science, isn't it? Or an art form, rather. So you start to say, okay, this is all of the behaviours we've observed. The dog walker, the student explorer. We classified these groups. New money. New money. The family groups. <laughs> because people start to have similar sorts of lifestyles and characteristics. So we group them. And the idea of creating a fictitious person is so that you've got somebody that the design team can look for and say, okay, now I'm designing for that person or this person or that person. At the end of the design process, when you've got the concepts there and we're going, oh, this is a fantastic concept, you can then take Julie Smith, who's a dog walker, and go, how's Julie going to react to this? Yes. And, and you can put them back into the space. Have we met her needs? We're missing some dog-friendly facilities and infrastructure. And that came out, didn't it? Yeah, and that's similarly yeah. with uh, the younger family, saying we want a more family-friendly, child-friendly environment. Fiona Robe um, famously said about one of our sites, Jacaranda Square. Oh, I love that um, quote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People aren't sure about how to have fun here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that was quite a, a game. Have fun? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the personas really help you put yourself in someone else's perspective. Street Furniture Australia, um, you know, we put big pictures of personas on the, on the wall. wall. You're always reminded of who you're designing for. The next one is the workshop, discovery workshop. We had how many stakeholders did we engage? I think through the workshops we engaged about 80 odd yeah, people did. throughout the Sydney Olympic Park Authority and Very diverse range of City people. of Parramatta, We Murbeck, had some academics, we had art, ac visual artists, yes. performing artists, small business people. Community members. It was all done online. It was COVID times. What's the value of that, David? People have an equal opportunity to say something, express something. I think that's a real leveller. We probably achieved in about six or eight weeks of consultation and listening and empathy in probably half the time that it would normally take. So we use these discovery workshops to understand people's pains and potential gains. Then we embarked in this thing called co-design, also called participatory design, has lots of names. Um, yeah, tell us about co-design. Co-design is designing with someone, not for someone. It's much more sensitive to their needs than if you're using your special expertise as a designer to impose your thoughts on someone. When somebody else is really involved in the design too, then it's sort of a shared responsibility. Uh, and that's, you just get a different approach to it. And, and generally, it's richer. It has things that you would never have thought of because you don't really live there as a designer. You, you're often in this circumstance where you're designing for somebody. I mean, there's lots of different combinations of these things that can be successful. I don't fully believe in the design thinking approach where everybody can be a designer. If you're a banker, you can be a designer. You know, I, I think what we had was a nice mix where we had very competent, skilled and talented designers in the room, carefully working with the uh, our community. And not picking up the pen. And not picking up the pen till they had deep understanding. And then when you really understand the issues, away you go and you can design with such confidence that the community are going to love what you do. When we collaborated with ACT government uh, for the Woden experiment, for the co-design session there, we invited a social scientist. People with different points of view makes you humble and makes you learn by having them in the room. Think about the other disciplines, competences that you could bring in that would make it rich. In the case of environments, it's those end users that are spending a lot of time there and if they become part of the process, you, you cannot beat it. Let's break down the co-design workshop. We compiled all the discovery learnings, presented it to the key stakeholders. These are what people feel about the space, these are the pain points, these are the potential opportunities. And then we got people all online. We used a tool called Miro to co-design based on those findings. We started with individual breakout sessions. So we pulled everybody out into the small teams and each team was asked to study one of the domains. So then you get quite an interesting dynamic going on because in each team you might have had a landscape architect, sometimes an industrial designer, definitely a stakeholder, a retailer or somebody who's Asset manager. very much involved <laughs> and living in there. That team would then working on that domain. How can they create experiences that are uplifting and joyful? They had 10 or 15 minutes on 
their own. And then we reconvened into a whole larger team and we started sharing the ideas. And what you get then is this rather interesting dynamic goes on because one thought process stimulates another team and they grab that and they're encouraged to copy. Mm. Uh, because there's nothing wrong with stealing an idea in a team and using that. Some of the ideas that were started out mediocre got richer towards the end of the session. The other thing that I find interesting about the process is that you start with a very open mind. And so everybody's given that sort of indication at the start. Don't feel limited. Don't feel restricted by budgets. Envisage a new future. Towards the end of the session, you have to change everybody's mindset. You have to say, okay, now I want you to come down. I want you to put your critical hat on. So I've let you play and now we've got to really think what is right for Sydney Olympic Park? What, what is going to fall within reasonable budgets? Can we execute it in a time frame that's given? That's when we voted on the mirror board, which is an infinite digital board. You've got sketches and post-it notes and all this stuff up there. Individuals are putting red dots on the things they believe in. We can all pull back and look at this giant board. You can see clusters of groups where these are must-haves for the community. And that's really powerful because then CM Plus, the design team, know what to make. They know what to sketch. They know where to start thinking, these are the hot spots. These are the domains the community must have. We ended up with a list for Mantej, yes. the placemaking manager, a very practical sort of to-do list. That's that right, and that's very valuable for a public agency or a council or a state agency. It's really important to be able to respond to what people are looking for. And I guess the voting prioritisation is really important. I've got to ask the question, because it's probably a question everyone has. Why did you engage a street furniture company to do community consultation? <laughs> That's a very good question, um, June. I think, look, getting back to um, COVID, uh, we, I sat down with my very good colleague, Mantej Singh in the place management team, and we said, what are we going to do? And we'd been talking about, and we'd been aware that SFA were um, the talk of the town and the placemaking community and I had personally seen the work that had been done as part of the AILA conference in Canberra in 2016 in Garima Place. Mantej also travelled to Canberra and he was aware of what you were doing in Woden in the activation over a longer period of time. Peer-to-peer -peer learning in government is very important so we were very attuned to what the ACT government was doing. Right when COVID hit and everything was shut down yeah. we thought well let's do it. We'd been thinking about it for a while and the timing just felt right. I have to say, we're not placemaking experts. We're street, we're very, um, but we love. But I think you're part of the. I think, like we a lot it. of professional people <laughs> and industry, there's a community of uh, what we call a community of practice, and whether it's industrial designers, landscape architects, urban designers. Um, industry people like yourselves, I think everyone's got a role to play in place making and place activation. Well, Mark, Mark's um, our design director and advisor and he's taught us that we shouldn't just focus on the product and the nuts and bolts, we need to understand the context. Which is why we started engaging in backyard experiment and yeah. research basically. But at the end of the day, we just want to make better products. Um, but we hope all this additional research helps our audience today. Um, Mark, what, do you have anything to add there? <laughs> Look, I think that's a good conclusion, June. I found it very interesting to see if we could take these methods about, you know, with a typical design project, you've got discovery, concept and implementation. And can a discovery process that's used around um, human-centred design work in placemaking? That was sort of a big question for me. I was curious about that. And we proved it in Canberra, in ACT, with Woden and Garima Place, and then David, you engaged again and we're now on another journey around this path and it's really turning out to be very fruitful. One of the things here is, you know, saying to designers, don't be too serious. Let's get messy, <laughs> let's mess the place up, let's have fun. We started experimenting at Jacaranda Square already. We thought, well, we'll give this a go, reactivate the park. People love to be able to position furniture, whether they're just meeting by themselves and they might want to be thinking and, and doing some work outside or whether they're meeting and having a coffee break with their work colleagues, very flexible. In industrial design, we do prototypes all the time to test them. So what you're actually doing is prototyping a space and testing a space with these elements in there. Do an installation and, and note the reaction and then escalate it, tune it, modify it and put it out again. How would you like to see Sydney Olympic Park 
well, becoming. Well, we've already seen some visions from CM Plus about what it might be. And for example, the uh, pop-up park, you know, where they're surrounded by um, very large residential towers. You know, there's places for kids to play. There's um, opportunities to grow fruit and vegetables for the community. Uh, you can prepare food in a good way, in a collective way with family. You know, places to th throw the ball, even places for exchanges of uh, sale goods, you know, like a, a, a market day. <laughs> we'll start to see the, these pockets of life bloom. Dog walkers enjoying themselves in a different way and new, new routes through the park and all of those Personas have something in the designed outcome. Delightful experiences Delightful for the experiences. personas. <laughs> That's right. I, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm a student. Well said. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, it's been fascinating and really looking forward to seeing what emerges in the Sydney Olympic Park. I think we are too. I think there's a lot of excitement. I know particularly Thanks, within government and the Sydney Olympic Park Authority, my peers, we've got a small town emerging and it's going to be quite exciting to see how it evolves around thinking about experiences and software and hardware. And we're back. Let's start with some initial thoughts from Chris for a US perspective on what we've seen. Then we'll get to the questions in the chat box. Chris, thoughts? Would you like to share? Sure, most definitely. Thank you, Juanita. Um, I have a few things. One um, is kind of more of an observation and maybe a couple others that are, could be turned into questions. It's up to the, uh, the panel. But uh, first I'd like to say that I'm really loving this process um, that seems to give ownership to the people in these communities that it's serving without seeming that their dreams are limited. It, sound, it feels like they would really receive ownership of what they are creating um, through this process. And I think that's really, really exciting. I've been a part of uh, those kind of processes before too. And it, and it really, um, you get that, inherent buy-in from the beginning um, with the community, especially the, the, their longer term residents. Um, that kind of segues into one of, my, one of my comments is that one of the challenges is that um, a lot of this increasing population density on the outside of the park is gonna be relatively new. So in those empathy interviews, I would imagine that you'd want to really know your demographics. They could be widely varying. So you could get a wide variety of experiences and passions and, 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 and what have you, not necessarily associated with that location. So it, it could be challenging uh, to find some uh, consistency um, throughout all those interviews. But at the same time, um, you, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process that, uh, you know, works really well and I've uh, partaken in it. It's a lot of fun. I, I actually personally enjoy it. And uh, we're, we'll definitely get some um, kernels of truth through that. A couple other observations. Um, uh, something that we've learned here in San Diego is that um, you know we established a relatively new city plaza located in the downtown, and it was it it, it lacks a few fundamental principles of why it would succeed. Uh, but uh, one of them is that um, the fact is is that programmed events alone, and this was highlighted in the video, uh, cannot can e keep uh, public spaces alive on their own. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it, they could only keep so many programmed events going uh, throughout the course of a, of a year uh, to keep it busy. The rest of the year, it's relatively empty or completely empty. So you really have to create spaces that serve the daily needs of, of the local community and program and events as, as a lesson learned on this end. A few, through a few case studies, besides just the one in San Diego, um, this definitely could be one of the goals. Um, and um, I guess the la lastly is the most obvious one is it's a, it's a question of scale. Uh, you're going to be experiencing all this increasing density on the outside, on the outside perimeter and in the adjacent um, residential areas surrounding the park. And it's very much in contrast with the very open monumental nature of the park itself. And so one of the, one of the goals that I would like to encourage, and this is probably obvious to a lot of people, but it's also part of uh, my uh, specialty within um, urban design, uh, so I'm particularly interested in this, is um, that the park itself needs to be feel comfortable, inviting and inherently sociable, some place that they, they feel like they, that is kind of becomes their outdoor living room, especially to a lot of the, um, to the local residents there. They, they feel that they can go there, uh, run into some people they know, or meet some people that they, they haven't met before, 
and um, potentially have a unique experience every time they head down to the park. So uh, those are my, just some of my initial thoughts and I uh, open it up to the panel. Everyone, you can um, raise your hand in the um, reactions panel down the bottom if you wanted to ask a question. I know I see some familiar faces, but um, just unmute your, your, um, your unmute button and, and ask your question and away you go. And perhaps if we can see you, that would be nice so we can interact a little more as well. So um, questions, anybody, I'll just throw it out. Take it away, whoever. Look, I, I have a question. It's uh, Glenn from Melbourne. Hi, Glenn. Look, I really enjoyed the presentation firstly, and I love the idea of, of Homify. I love that concept. I mean, obviously we've all had to engage with our own local uh, green spaces or you know shopping strips and to sort of investigate how that with the failings of the the uh, lack of fine and grain kind of um, you know amenity the question that that always comes up with me uh, with urban spaces and, and the, the sort of the intersection between human use and I know we're talking about human human centric design here but is always that balance of getting enough visual complexity and biodiversity into our spaces particularly our urban uh, highly trafficked highly used spaces and I'd be really interested for this discussion to also include temporary ecosystem services and support for amenity if we could somehow just bring that in uh, and it could be uh, that we're literally engaging community and actually putting back some sort of amenity or in some ways introducing complexity that is rewarding and activating of community input. So I think that obviously is a kind of a passive aspect to use the space, but there's an active aspect as well. I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, it's possibly a little bit off, uh, <laughs> off the main subject line, but it's something that's close to my heart. Glenn, did you um, have a specific question you wanted one, someone on our panel to, to try and address? Oh, look, apologies. That was more of a thought than a question. <laughs> My question is, with these processes of engagement with communities, are we actually talking about ecosystem services as well in terms of the actual biology of the spaces and, and what people's concerns are in terms of the amenity of that? Go ahead, David, Martin. Take it away. Glenn, very good question there. And I go back to, I think, what um, Chris said at the beginning about human habitat. You yep. might remember um, when we started the briefing, there was the sort of pullback helicopter shot of Olympic Peninsula. Yes. Because we have every kind of biodiversity and habitat and threatened species you could imagine, literally 200, 300, five-minute walk from these more urban human habitat spaces. And I think... What Mark uh, said to me that one of the first things that really found challenging about Olympic Park is the scale. So we have all the ecosystem services. We have all that biodiversity. In fact, the park is known as a biodiversity hotspot. Right. Um, but it, I guess it's the distance of where people actually live in that sort of 400 metre, 800 metre radius is many of those things are just in their everyday um, patterns of movement they're there you can see them from your apartment but probably it's what's happening at the bottom of your building and literally in that 400 meter arc that's where we really are wanting to do it so yes we do have complexity and biodiversity and we are very aware of ecosystem services but probably one of the things around the park is it has a master plan i think of it as a donut it has a master plan for its urban core and then a separate master plan for its parklands and as many people have said to me over many occasions where is this linkage between the two? And that's probably where it's planning, in the planning sort of um, strategic planning that's going on at the moment, we're trying to improve the walkability, cyclability, that people can leave the really hardcore urban environment and, and be on a boardwalk in a mangrove with, you can't even see the towers that are literally 500 metres away and you can be in that space after the 500 school kids have left all their um, environmental education programs, you can have that space to yourself. So you can have that contact with nature, it's there, but probably it's this, really what's happening in that 400 metre, 800 metre arc is, is quite our challenge. And I think with density comes this concept of urbanity. And I think as this is where everyone struggles, planners, placemakers, place activators, how do you start to introduce this urbanity? And I just think that's another word for human habitat. Okay. I'd like to thank you, David. Um, I'd like to go to Stephanie. Stephanie McCann, if you can ask a question, let us know where you're from. I'm actually from Sydney Olympic Park with David. Um, 
I'm the Acting Manager of Events and Activations at Sydney Olympic Park Authority at the moment. And um, I guess I'm, I'm actually quite new. I'm only three months into the job. But in terms of the scale, um, that was the one thing that sort of stood out for me too, David, um, in what the earlier discussions were. And just about activating the space um, for events, whether they be event extensions for larger major events or whether they be small and more intimate local events for hyperlocals is, is understanding the scale because obviously if we're planning on having 4,000 residents and then potentially 20,000 with a, you know, a daily foot traffic of 100,000 in a couple of years, I guess just talking about events and activations in terms of scale post COVID, if anyone has any ideas of, obviously we've looked at our personas from a marketing perspective to understand who would attend events. Um, but I guess I'm just open to anyone's um, ideas on how to think about the scalability of events that might need to be hyperlocal, but have the capacity to you know, to, to grow. Um, we, did, we did a small event recently that we thought, oh, maybe because of COVID, we might only get, you know, 300 people a night or whatnot. And we ended up getting about close to two and a half thousand over the course of three nights. And that was great. It was fine. But if it had turned into 30,000, we had the space, but possibly hadn't thought of how far it would get. So anyway, just thought I'd open up the floor to anyone who had any suggestions for activations and, and events for hyperlocal communities. Stephanie, the only thing, just from an industrial designer's perspective there, what I think is interesting is experimentation and, and using events like you would, like June mentioned in the, in the video there, that you could try little experiments, you know, use a corner space, promote it lightly amongst, amongst the smaller community, lots of experimentation until you get formulas that are starting to trigger responses in the community. Because you've got this wonderful sort of palette to work yeah. with in that domain. And so I think that might be a nice way for you to just start taking risks, but risks are fine if they're small. Yeah, that's, that's what we're doing at the really moment. So that's a good... Glad to hear you think we're on the same same page with that. That's great. Just going to chime in to to um, to Chris. We were talking about in our preparation earlier in the week. Chris was saying in San Diego there are areas where um, there are spaces that have been intentionally designed for tourists, but not necessarily for the locals. And I think you could almost say that's a bit of a challenge for Olympic Park. It was beautifully designed for big mega events, and as Stephanie has said, you know, how do we get and it's not either or, it's sort of getting both. And I'm saying that we start off with this thing about major events and having mini events. And I think what Stephanie's describing in our situation, given the density, is we're going to have these in-betweenies where you're not going to get 80,000 people getting into the stadium. And you might have started off with a, a, a test event and getting 800. But we've got to get comfortable with this sort of 8,000 because when you look at the numbers of local residents of 23 and a half plus another... 15 or so behind our stadium, you're going to be um, somehow hitting the sort of magic in between. So it's not one or the other. The designers of the spaces have to be really clever to make it really multifunctional. And just on Mark's comment and getting back, Chris, you know, you told us about this innovation that was led by the United States. I don't know whether it was Landscape Architects, but the National Parking Day that started 20 over two decades ago, I think, in North America. And we've adopted that in Australia. But now, as I said, recently been down in Melbourne with COVID response that it's not National Parking Day. It's become National Parking Summer or a whole season of uh, mm -hmm. curbside areas that used to be for parking and now being devoted to outdoor dining. And we've learned that from that experimentation and risk-taking that Mark's describing, it's now sort of been adapted into a longer, more semi-permanent approach. Chris, do you have a bit of a discussion or any comments on that National Parking Day dialogue we had early in the week? Yeah, most definitely. Um, here in San Diego uh, and in other places I've lived, uh, I've organized um, parking day events uh, in, in those respective cities. And they are a great um, pop-up solution that is as small scale um, as many spaces as you want. 
but it doesn't necessarily have to be a parking day per se because you know what you have is this ma majorly large palette across the entire Olympic Park to play with. It's it's pretty much you have every corner of it uh, at any varying scales can accommodate any one of many <laughs> events. So I wouldn't limit yourself to small events or big events or medium events. I would just go with everything. Have as many many and more as possible. This is kind of like your ex before a lot of this stuff gets. Um, a lot of this new design gets codified and, 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 and permanent. You can create a lot of very creative artistic um, experiments basically with a lot of small events, um, whether they're passive, artistic, uh, sports. I mean, there just has to be some kind of coordination across the park. Uh, I, I imagine there's gonna be some permitting involved, some coordination so people don't step on each other's toes. But any and all the above and having as many as possible, if you are to rely pretty much on programmed events to keep your public space alive, you're going to ha have to keep a have a lot of them going constantly. Otherwise, it's going to be dead most of the time um, until that park gets more designed in such a way that, you know, has a, a, a fine, more finer granularity and, and daily um, services and amenities that serve, serve the local population. But luckily, one box that you have checked off is that densifying local population that's going to be increasing. So that's at a minimum, that's what you want for any kind of public space. I mean, this is a particularly large one, uh, but yeah, I, I wouldn't limit yourself to the, the kinds of events, um, you know, basically perhaps you can somehow advocate and introduce and, and invite people to have events. Uh, they just have to go through some, obviously some kind of curation process, but um, I would just have as many as possible going on until, you know, as kind of a, to bring more attention to the Olympic Park, um, even before we get any design going, just to organize these events across this entirely large palette that it's, it's kind of an opportunity in a sense. Maybe there's one thing I'll add to that as well. Look, I think one of the great takeaways from HOMOFI was the and this was always clear when you looked at the plan of Sydney Olympic Park, but one of the great takeaways was that Homify was about a constellation of spaces. It wasn't really about Jack Aranda Square doing everything for everybody. So, I mean, I think probably one of the answers to your question, and David, this is one of the things we kicked around when we were when we were designing Homify, is that when you're having a party at home, it starts in the lounge room and eventually it gets a little bigger, more guests arrive, it spills into the kitchen and so forth. So if you think about Sydney Olympic Park as a series of rooms, and they're all connected through the laneways, the streets, um, and you sort of have a flexible approach to the kinds of things you want to have, it's okay if the party spills over into the next room. And, and all these spaces then have their own personalities. One, one of the challenges we had with Homify was that um, there were a lot of ideas about a lot of spaces. Uh, you know, the dog walkers wanted lots of things in every space and so forth, but the spaces each have their own personalities. Some of them, the front door to the park, some of them are more of the, the family room of the park. And understanding that, that each space could start to fulfill some of the needs. So collectively, the park provided a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, the beauty of that is also that it allowed people then to explore the park and find something a little different in each place. That touches on some of the things that Chris is saying about, that starts to take the pressure off of City Olympic Park Authority to keep curating because people are going to start finding shortcuts through the back way and discovering the park for themselves. So I think it's about understanding that you're working with a constellation of places and that takes the pressure off of having to completely control the event. Yeah, uh, just to comment a little bit more on that, it's perfectly said, it is, it's a series of rooms that all can be going on simultaneously. And how cool would it be that you code a one event and you hear off in the distance or you see it off in the distance, something else going on, and as long as it's public, you want to maybe go over Absolutely. there and check it out after, during your event or maybe after your event. I mean, that, that right there is community building. That right there is connecting people that will otherwise not have met. And um, that's actually on a smaller scale. That's what happens in urban plazas quite a bit. But this is kind of like a, a massive scale. So it's, it's going to be really interesting. And Chris, that also starts activating the in-between spaces between the, the named places, which further starts to create those urban collisions of excitement that make urbanity so wonderful. Great, great stuff, guys. I've got Kathleen Brand with her hand up for a little while, so I'm going to go to her. Kathleen, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, let us know where you're from. Okay. 
maybe we can come back to Kathleen. Um, we have Christine Murphy. You've got a great question. Are you still there, Christine? You can unmute yourself and, and perhaps ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, did, would you just like to read my question? Yeah, re you can read it if you like. You've got some really great points in there that I'm sure everyone might want to um, address. Oh, why don't you have a read and go from there? <laughs> Thank all you. Right. From Christine, for all speakers. Okay, guys, great talk. Can you explain ideas for next steps? in overlaying activation and livability of Sydney Olympic Park. Have partnerships been created yet for realization of these ideas? And can this process be the start of developing citizen stewardship, engaging residents and others in ways which activators we've heard at the same time? Share in stewarding care and sustainability of this unique place um, lots of ideas for activation, especially recalling ideas from Millennium Parklands, um, engage education, sporting, natural and cultural. Your question really relates to can the process start the developing of citizen steward stewardship? Yes, I think I think there's an obvious thing there that these this team here has already started that process. And I think let's get these people on the hook and build on this momentum that's been started there. So I'm just keen to hear whether there's step-by-step -step strategies and next steps that this team have already come up with for taking all this to the next level. Thank you. I'm happy to start, Christine, and I can speak a little bit about the next design steps, and perhaps David can talk a little bit more about the project governance. Um, the next step, and I think it was alluded to in the presentation, that the next step is really, it sounds a bit odd, but to get started, put something on the ground, get something in there. That really is continuing the dialogue from, from all of the design workshops we had. Let's see how it works. Uh, let's talk to people as they're using it. As Mark said, let's observe uh, the ripples and the waves that come from those pebbles we've dropped into these spaces, see what starts to happen. Um, some of the spaces have small areas of community gardening that we've identified uh, that immediately gets a stewardship and a sort of a land husbandry going in the park. Uh, people start to own the backyard, so to speak. Um, and I really, I think getting, getting um, shovels into the ground is really the next step. From that, we'll evolve a stronger dialogue with the people that are there. There'll be new residents arriving all the time, and then this will start to become codified. Uh, the spaces need to evolve over time, and the community will be part of that because we'll be touching base with them, and David's team will be touching base with them as the construction proceeds, and uh, as all of the inputs then sort of guide that through the next 5, 10, 20 years of these spaces evolution. David, maybe you could talk about some of the work SOPA has been doing in that space. David, yeah, no, that... before you do, just could I interject there for a second because it's burning. Um, I'd just like to bring June in. You know, June, when it comes to um, uh, stewardship, I'm really interested if you could perhaps share with everybody Garima Place and the chairs and the ownership that the community suddenly had. We're a street furniture company and um, we're nervous about introducing movable seats into the public realm. Um, what can go wrong, right? <laughs> so we did an experiment where we put, um, collaborating with Ayla, we put 60 movable seats out in Garima Place in Canberra and um, we wanted to see if any go missing. Um, and because we involve the community from day one, um, and we made friends with the homeless and street community there. Um, yeah, there was just a wonderful sense of ownership over the elements. And in, at the end of the experiment, none of them got stolen. In fact, the homeless community told us, um, you know, you have to watch out for the drunks at night, but that's okay. We'll guard the chairs for you. <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, so it was a beautiful lesson there in, um, in, in the importance of community ownership and and forming that sense of um, security through through involving everyone in the community. Sorry, David. That's all right. No, they're all very good comments. And look, Christine, thank you. That's a very well considered and a very good question to throw back at us as a group. But certainly it has led to change and it's probably worth just backtracking a little bit to say that the first residents arrived at Sydney Park only a little under 10 years ago. 
It took 12 years after the Olympics to move the first residents in. Unlike the planning for London Olympics, people were already living on the Olympic London Olympic site years before the game started. So one of Sydney's probably not so strong areas, even though we arguably not delivered the best games ever, the legacy planning was a bit slow. And I think, you know, building community from scratch is a fantastic opportunity for us professionals, but it's quite unusual. Uh, Garima Place is quite a different context in the centre of Canberra, but I think responding to Christine's um, interest in resident and citizen stewardship, uh, I think, Chris, you made some comments to me about understanding the, de the demographics and cultural factors. And it's fair to say that the people, the, the pioneering community, community that makes up Olympic Park is made up of not your normal suburban Australian population or even CBD population. Uh, we watch the demographics and uh, cultural factors very closely. I'm sure the property and commercial team, we, we know from the national census data that's collected every four years. So we have a biggest group is coming from China, uh, Korea, India, Iran. There's a lot of other overseas born. So we know that we've got a lot of quite, um, the thing with Olympic Park, it's not renowned for its affordable housing. It's, it's quite a, in the part of Sydney where it is. You pay a premium to live there. But those people coming from those cultural backgrounds don't normally, don't necessarily engage. We run events and we found that people wouldn't come along to a consultation. You need to provide food and activities and things their family could do. And we learned that traditional um, public sector approaches to community consultation don't work in a place where your community is still really just evolving. The glue hasn't yet formed. Um, it's exciting that that's going to happen. So I'm just talking about that. And in fact, we've been trying to do things like community gardens. Everyone's been saying, oh, we should do that. You should. No one wants to do it. There's no interest. We've actually been trying to give away food growing kits. We're trying to, we've formed a space. It's not the right thing at the moment with the cultural and, and uh, people with disposable income that are coming in. No one, we haven't, no champions have emerged for something as a community garden, which from a landscape architect's point of view, you think, why can that be? I think we just have to be a little bit more patient. But just on the other issue is um, what is it happening here is that uh, there's a one of the developers that helped build the Olympic Village, Murbach, has just completed a 1500 apartment complex called the Pavilions. And about 20% of that is, um, devoted purely what's to called build to rent. I don't know whether you have this term in the US, guys. So that the developer is not building their apartments to sell to investors or uh, long-term owners. It's actually retaining about 25% of that build for affordable housing. That's not public housing, but it's housing that might be pitched at people are on average incomes like school teachers, ambulance drivers, uh, people working in public sector. So. We're thinking that that's going to lead to a more stable population. We know we've had students coming and going. We've got a lot of Airbnb, unsurprisingly. So after only barely a decade of people living there, it's just starting to gel now. But I think that, you know, the traditional sense of resident and citizen stewardship, I think, Christine, it's a matter of let's come back and look at this place in another three or four years, and I think it's going to be fascinating. The last comment I was going to say, and one of the things that the authority is now doing around um, event, event stewardship is instead of the authority always having this responsibility to fill the calendar full of events, it's now inviting external third party people with a small amount of money up to about $30,000 to come and propose an event that they want to run in the space. And so we've had Sydney's vegan markets. So one of the things that came out of Homify was that people wanted to see more semi-regular events. And they describe those things like growers markets where you can buy healthy food or summer evening noodle markets, which are occurring in other parts of Sydney. But I think maybe one of the ripple effects of Homify is starting to look at, yes, we have to run the big mega events with other venue holders, but this sort of in-betweeny stuff that's starting to emerge really interestingly is where you actually invite people to come and run the event and you just play more of a backseat facilitation role. Uh, Chris, do you think that that has some parallels with anything that's happening in US cities? 
I think that's really successful um, as opposed to one entity being responsible for making sure that the calendar is full, um, but facilitating it instead and inviting others to run their own events. And I, I think that's much going to be much more su successful. Uh, uh, David, you, you mentioned uh, something about the next three years. Is that when a lot of the projected uh, residential growth is going to occur? Uh, no, actually, I think everyone thinks it's going to be fill up by 2030. But what's happening at the moment is the metro, uh, which is an underground high speed rail system, uh, is being delivered in the park. And that'll be open about 2029, 20, 2030. We might be getting light rail as well. But certainly the pace of development, apartment development around and inside the peninsula, despite COVID, hasn't stopped. Um, it's been phenomenal. One other little issue that I'd like to just raise, and I'm conscious of time, and it was something that's been coming up with, I did talk to my, my wife's niece had been living in San Francisco with her husband, had a child, they've been living mainly in Asia for most of their careers, but they spent the last three years in San Francisco before coming back. And I know San Fran's are maybe different from San Diegans, but you're both living on the Pacific Rim. This is a sort of a common challenge for, I think, a lot of Western cultures is, one of the things that COVID has done is it's got people walking and cycling more and using streets and public spaces and being more active. Some of those people are not really not used to being on bikes and they might not be skilled at cycling and well, certainly we all experience it at walking, but um, there's been an explosion of what we call active transport. And uh, we do have 11,000 car spaces. And one of the criticisms that's often leveled at the park is that it's it's very car dependent, it's very car centric. And we know that people are getting in cars just to drive two or three kilometres because some of the network of active transport trails and hasn't really changed for about 15 years. I'm just wondering, again, Chris, throwing it back to the um, our North American audience, do you see any subtle shifts in car dependency in US culture? and in US cities? Has there been a bit of a shift that's noticed? And do you think that might be a sort of semi-permanent thing of more walking, more cycling? Well, most definitely. Um, San Diego is very historically a automobile dependent oriented city since the mid-century, last century. But something that's been very encouraging even pre-pandemic is um, the company that I actually work for, but also other companies as well have been hired uh, for uh, multimodal active transportation plans. And, you know, usually revolving around cycling, um, scooters, and potentially even electric vehicles, like little minibuses that people can hop on and off, um, just wider multi-use lanes, multi-paths, um, not necessarily involving public transport or streetcar, but I feel like this situation, especially because of its scale <clears throat> and its adjacency to that, um, you know, that uh, residential density, is pedestrian priority first, and then really look at some grander scheme of getting people from the city through some kind of streetcar quick, quick bus system. Um, but of course, I, I think the success of this is going to really rely much on the act, an active transportation plan coupled with the design almost in tandem. Otherwise it's gonna continue to be a destination. It was designed to be a destination and hence all the parking spaces. And, mo and something that you know, uh, doesn't succeed a lot, uh, even in the States, are these ideas of destination parks, and they've been around for a long time, or destination resorts or whatever. It just requires an automobile or a very long bike ride to get to, whereas we, are, we have a park here that's surrounded by residential density, and we have a greater city that can get to it. I think it just, with a, an active transportation plan, is, is, is crucial um, in visiting all modes, but also for this, because of the scale, um, got to somehow incorporate some kind of uh, public transportation solution as well to get people there easily. Um, and then, of course, just some kind of way of getting pedestrians there safely and easily. Um, just, you know, at, at the drop of a hat, they can make a decision to go visit the park today as opposed to having to make a big hike over there. <laughs> just something that, you know, I think that that has to be a priority in addition to those active transportation solutions. I was actually going to do a time check for everybody just to check in and say that, and that was supposed to be 15 minutes ago. However, here we are. Since our discussion is going so well, we can um, keep going and um, have a couple more questions. Uh, and have a couple of raised hands. And for those of you that have to leave, um, thank you for joining us. Um, I might just throw to Nikki. She might not want to ask this question, but she's got some really amazing um, observations here um, about ownership 
is being very um, powerful and seeing firsthand how involving the community in a project. What's so funny, and I'm sorry, I'm not using my video, is that um, I'm under Nikki's name, but it's Suzanne. So I, I said Suzanne at the end of my little thing to you is just that I've worked with many designers. We are uh, a manufacturer representative. However, I've seen firsthand how ownership is so completely empowering to the community and just seeing how the result and the greater sense of pride and responsibility can happen when the community does have some involvement in it. It's interesting to me though, because I see for designers, how it could be very controversial because you guys have so many other things to consider. You know, you have the government and the city and everything to consider, including the community. So I was wondering, like, how, how do you guys manage that? From my standpoint, you know, I see how you guys work in a very small scale, but how do you manage your designs when you're dealing with so many criteria on a, a government side too? Dick, that might be a question for you, I'm thinking. Yes, it sounds like it is. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And uh, look, it's one I probably ask myself every day. How am I going to manage all these uh, inputs? Uh, I think the biggest challenge is a lot of the inputs are, uh, they can be contradictory. So, uh, but look, I think the, the best way to manage that is to keep the big picture in mind and to understand that the journey to get to a resolution of the big picture might not be in the direction you think it needs to go. I know that's kind of a, a broad answer, but um, there, there obviously there are obviously statutory things like safety we need to consider, um, getting things approved, getting things across the line. But I think the bigger challenge is, is all the soft, the soft power stuff and uh, managing the community's expectation, meeting their expectations, but also understanding that sometimes the expectations of the community is in conflict with itself. Uh, so it's, it's a balancing, it's a balancing game. But if you can keep, I think if you can keep the big picture in mind, and this is, it sounds like a sort of motherhood statement, but understanding that these are public spaces for the public good um, and ensuring that the widest benefit goes to the widest audience is, is really what you can do. Sometimes these squeaky wheels make the most noise. So you have to be aware of that as well. You know, going, going on to a more global look at it, it's interesting that we're all on Zoom at the moment and we're really talking about these very fine grain inputs from the community and about how it works. We're really talking about these touchable things. And June talked about the furniture and ownership of the furniture by the homeless people and protecting that. That's a very fine grained piece of ownership, you know, ensuring that the life of a chair is safe in your space. Um, so I think these sorts of issues will be getting more important as we move forward. There'll be a lot more voices coming to the conversation. So I think keeping the big picture in mind is even more important. Um, you know, we're on a Zoom meeting from around the world. We're talking about very fine grain. There's that idea of high tech, high touch, uh, which is about a 40 year old idea from John Nesbitt that in the future, there'd be so much technology that we'd, we'd have so much high tech that we need a lot more high touch. And I think um, Homify is a really good example of this playing itself out. COVID has sharpened the pencil, but technology is here to stay. So uh, understanding that the touch and the big picture come together is probably a broad answer to the question. How do we manage all these competing visions? And I have another hat, as well as being a registered landscape architect, I've studied sustainable development. And it really helps that, and I give regular lectures to master's students in sustainability at several universities. And I say that um, it was really out of this Green Games eco legacy that came 20 years ago, it was the um, adoption of a sustainability framework back in 2019 with the Green, Green Building Council of Australia. I know that you'll have a Green Building Council in the US. Uh, and it's absolutely essential. This is like, a, it's got four legs to it around people, environment, economics, and governance. And since we've adopted that um, uh, sustainability framework, it enables you to have the conversation and find the 80-20, because the competing visions between dollars and car parking and developers and frogs and threatened species and traffic, you know, it is an immensely complex environment. It's absolutely essential to have some kind of sustainability framework because it only arrived the year before we were thinking about one of the reasons we couldn't, didn't start Homify because the timing wasn't right. 
how it changed was a year before Homify because of our Green Star community obligations, which is externally audited by an external body outside of government. One of the things that we, of the 30 submissions that we had to prepare, we had to have a community development plan. So that kind of forced the authority to start thinking about people and residents and those things for the first time because it had to. And I think this um, managing the competing visions and managing community expectations, it really helps if you've got some kind of a sustainability framework in place. There was an important question, you know, how um, around government, how can we engage and how do we get through that sort of quagmire, if you will. I think HomeFi is equally applicable to government as it is the so-called end user, the park user, the street user. You know, that empathetic approach, I think, is something that government, you know, is an approach that governments would embrace. Um, I work in government, so I'm, I'm part of the blockage. Um, you know, but understanding, I think, the problems from the other side, that the regulatory side is also, uh, you know, um, an equal and equally important part of the process. I know you're working with David, but that's a unique situation. Um, but if you, to bring it out in a more day-to-day -day application, you know, maybe there's a, I'll stop there. Well, I just had a, a lasting comment. Basically, I just wanted to reiterate what um, Dick was saying earlier. As long as you have, you come to an overarching vision for the, the general future um, of, of the park, and then whatever, comes into play over the course of the park's life doesn't detract from it too much. I, I think um, that's that, that could be pretty much a realistic goal, but just to have to decide upon and develop and create a, a really solid vision. A, a, every time I've seen uh, municipalities um, in other parts of the country have very solid visions of what where they want their future to be, what they want their future to be, it usually ends up being very great. Um, so as, as long as you have some kind, it's almost like a mission statement and you don't detract away from it too much. Um, in addition to that environmental um, uh, framework that I think is, is very uh, essential as, as David mentioned, um, those two kind of, the, those are kind of like two uh, functional parts that are required for, for the success of this park in the long term. Somebody mentioned about, you know, the furniture being stolen, you know, from the park. Uh, in 2011, San Diego hosted the ASLA National Convention. And we had our trustee who was, um, you know, trying to do an experiment on, you know, what would happen if we took street furniture and we took trees and we put them in different areas. In other words, um, trees, furniture, um, you know, what happens when the people will want to want possibly gather, you know, together. And it was a really cool project. It was called the 10 Tree project who looks like Kathleen may have gone away. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, we started at one of the colleges and we put the, these 10 trees and all this furniture around the courtyard and people took the, the chairs and tables and they moved them on over under the trees. We then went to a uh, U University of California, San Diego, and we moved um, those trees. That was hard actually because they were giant trees um, <clears throat> to an area right uh, on the fringe of the campus. But what was interesting was it was near a bus stop and these students were elated because they didn't have to stand and wait for the bus. They could sit under the trees and, they, and the, the college then, once we moved the trees down to the convention center to do the last um, stop of the 10 trees tour, um, <clears throat> the college actually decided to do the same thing they actually planted 10 trees and they put furniture out at the bus stop. And um, we thought that was a major victory, you know, in trying to get people to understand if you provide a great setting for people, they're going to enjoy it. They're going to flock to it. And, um, you know, it was, <laughs> it was a logistical nightmare, but, um, you know, I'm the executive director of the San Diego chapter and, um, and it was just really, it was very cool to see how people responded. You know, hey, Tracy, I was just going to ask you, was that a deliberate form of tactical urbanism? That's what we hear a lot. <laughs> was, was that, were you guys doing it deliberately or was I it spontaneous? So, yeah, because our trustee um, 
has always been very parks oriented and he wanted to see how it might work in a, you know, in a, what is it, cement courtyard at the first college. And the first college was in a very hot part of San Diego. People had to keep coming on out and watering, you know, the trees so they wouldn't croak off. Um, <clears throat> we went to uh, the university, which is on the coast. And, um, and, you know, they had, you know, a good time there, but they had a lot of wind and a couple of trees got blown over. And so all of a sudden the university got ner nervous about liability. And, um, and so by the time we were about to move the trees down to the convention center, they looked really bad. <laughs> so the um, nursery that had been kind enough to donate them, uh, replaced them and put, you know, a little bit more, you know, lively looking, you know, trees on in. We put them near a trolley stop uh, because that was a great way to, you know, see whether people would flock, you know, to those um, areas. And the experiment was amazing. You know, we just thought it was a great way to kind of see exactly how people react, you know, to something that's not necessarily a, a permanent part of their setting. But it was really cool to see the University of San Diego actually implement it you know, um, after that experiment. Great story, Tracy. Um, I think we may have to wrap up everybody unless there was some last minute discussions. Um, we're very much over time, but I just wanted to thank everybody. Um, was there any final uh, words of wisdom anyone would like to share with us all? Thank you, everyone that's been involved in hosting with Street Furniture Australia, Ayla, Asla. Um, it's been terrific. And um, we should be thinking about, before we finish this one, what we should be doing on the next one. <laughs> I knew where that was going, David. <laughs> well said, David. Anytime. Thank you. We invite you all to street chat um, where we can discuss and post similar events in the future so you can stay up to date thank you very much for your questions any thank last you, panel questions? thank you street furniture thanks Chris. thank you everyone thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. thank you see you all again see you everyone. thanks for coming <laughs>